All right, folks, Wayne here from Merlwani, and with us today we have Paul Kur of November's Doom. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start the interview by asking you a very simple question, uh, and that is, why is November's Doom so fucking good? <laughs> uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people that would disagree with that statement, but... It uh, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, you know... Honestly, it's it's five guys who love what we do. We we really love the music that we create together, and I think we do it very well uh, as a group. And it it's basically just the love for what we do that drives us forward. And it's it's uh, our, you know our, our own personal um, desire to create something better every time and um it drives us uh, it's it's not about record sales it's not about how many likes on facebook it's not about it's not even about how many fans we can get that's always the bonus that's always the the uh that extra little something that makes it all worth it but in the end the end of the day we create the music that we love to please ourselves and and we have to be happy ourselves first and foremost and being our worst our own worst critics um, we push ourselves hard every time to create something better. Absolutely, man. That, that's really good to hear. And especially when you have such a wonderful catalog, which is, you know, almost an absolute genius to be precise, you know, and consistently strong. And and it's it's great to see a record like Hamartia, you know, which is uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, sounds fresh, sounds memorable, but also complements your uh, history as well. I'm sure you guys must be, you know, super stoked that you got just 10 days left for fans to listen. You guys have already released two tracks. How's been the feedback from the, the diehard November Dooms fan and probably, let's say, the newcomers to, to the band? You know, so far the reaction has been, you know, extremely well. It's, um, we, we have officially released two songs, uh, Plague Bird and Zephyr. And um, it's funny because as of 24 hours ago, uh, the the dreaded um, leak has happened. <laughs> so I, I'm starting, I yeah, I'm starting to get a lot of feedback from a lot of different people who have now heard uh, the whole album. And uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's pretty overwhelmingly positive from just about everyone so far. So yeah, I, I have... Uh, I, I'm I'm pretty humbled by that. I, it's pretty amazing. It's um, it, you know, I I appreciate when a lot of fans look at our entire catalog and they think it's strong and and they they enjoy the entire catalog. And uh, fortunately, we don't see it that way. And I think that's why we keep pushing ourselves to make something better and keep pushing harder and harder. Um. There's a lot of bands who I feel their first album is their masterpiece. And when the and when the album is that good, when the band first starts, that band has a career of chasing that record, trying to make people think that they have a better record than that one. I feel fortunate that we didn't know what we were doing. I don't think our early albums, especially the first album, is very good in any way it's it's kids who really don't know what they're doing and we're just we're fumbling our way through it and it, it gave us the opportunity to only go up from there and i think that's why every album is a learning experience we we try new things and that's why we can consistently try to do something that we feel is better and better and better all the way up and to to keep building better albums in that catalog so i i yeah i think you know, all along we've gotten better and better and better and better. And I, I, I attribute that to just learning. There, we learn something new every time. Absolutely. That, that kind of answers my next one because I was about to ask you regarding the consistency. And, and it's not just about you guys doing the same uh, stuff again and again. There's always that judicious sense of experimentation while you guys still stay fairly truthful to, you know, the, the death doom, uh, the root sound of November's doom. And then you have this... Uh, no, there's this boisterous sense of this 
uh, riffs, the hook laden riffs to be precise. You know, over the period of time, I've seen the band, you know, having a, a great sense of experimentation. And again, you guys are staying true. I found that on Blood White. I found that on, you know, the Pale Hound Departure and now on this record as well. Uh, you know, 28 years of history, almost three decades. And like you said that, you know, you guys get better and better and better with every record. But it's again, very, you know, it's a challenge to write fresh, memorable songs. And that can, you know, stick in someone's cranium for a long time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's why it takes us two years, sometimes three years between albums. And it's not because, I mean, we can put on another album six months from now, no problem at all. It, it's not a matter of writing music and releasing a record. That's very easy to do. But like you said, writing a record that is memorable and something special takes time. There's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of uh, weeding out bad things and and living with something for a little while and and we i mean we have complete songs that we wrote for this record that got discarded and we'll never we'll never go back to again sometimes we will write songs and we'll it, it's just not right and we we put a lot of time into trying to figure out okay how do we how do we fix this how do we improve it and sometimes it just doesn't happen and it never gets used again sometimes we'll revisit that song and we'll only take one idea from it or one riff and add it into another song. And yeah, it's a process. And, and I, I do believe that I don't think you can give somebody something great without putting in the time and the effort that goes into it. And yeah, that, that is a big part of it. Exactly. I, I completely, uh, and I'm, I'm able to relate to it because, uh, you know, as we're talking about the songwriting part, it's also wonderful to see how you guys balance the, the brutality with, with the emotional, the, the melody side of November's Doom that's always been uh, the USP of the band. And, and, and the way you guys arrange the tracks and add those, uh, the epic melancholic ambience. I got to give credit to Larry and you know Vito for for you know injecting those uh, along with the death metal aggression. It's something which is very important, uh, you know, to have a very good sense of uh, arrangement when when you're writing these songs. Is that something the band thinks about, or just comes naturally because you guys have been doing it for a long time? You know, that's Larry and I. Um... Larry and I sit down, especially when the album is over, and we will, like to us, the track order on an album is extremely important. I mean, we live in a we live in a day where people will play songs at random or singles, but to us, the album paints a picture. It tells a story from beginning to end, and and you have to adjust the songs accordingly. So. It, it paints a clear picture, so it takes you on an emotional roller coaster. It's it's not all the death metal songs up front and then all the weak songs at the end. You, you have to build a balance. And to be honest with you, because Larry and I are the two, the, the old men of the band, <laughs> we, uh, we, we've come up with metal. And one of the blueprints that we have always used in our records, and after I tell you this, you'll you'll totally understand what I mean. We have we have followed Metallica, Ride the Lightning, Master of Puppets as the blueprint for laying out our songs, meaning you start out with with a, a heavy hitter um, like Battery. Uh, by by song three or four, you're hitting your sanitarium, your your kind of your your ballady kind of song. Then you need like, and we always look at it like an album, like vinyl. Okay, what would be a good song to start side two? So you have to start with another heavy hitter. You want to end the album with the big epic track. So yeah, we, we definitely have a formula on how we lay out the songs for the album. And that's, you know, we totally borrow that from, you know, Metallica, who did it great back in the day. That's right. You know, I uh, I observed it even for, you know, uh, from the past few records that there's a sense of like the album itself starts on such a, you know, grand, heavy stuff. And then you have the ghost, which kind of, again, brings you back to that, that mid-tempo, more emotional. And then you have uh, the title track in the middle, again, kind of uh, slowing things down. So you have this sense of... Uh, Going faster, slowing faster, slowing. So that 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 order, the the sequence is is something that is really great. And and I also feel uh, Gary's drums have that sort of the you know it never lets the rhythmic section uh, particularly rest. His double strokes are are phenomenal, but it, at the same time, it doesn't affect that that tempestuous mood. 
Uh, that's what I've observed because you know, as far as if I if I think of the the, the stylistic evolution of of you guys, uh, the devil is always in the details. You know, as we discussed, the the, the creative output always seem to come uh, seem to be more percussively dynamic, and you guys don't restrict yourself just because it has to be highly paced. It's it's always about the character of the song, and that's what I love about how November Doom writes songs. Even though you have the fast drums, but you also add those, uh, those that that the mood that is created, those bits and pieces in the middle, which kind of adds more value to the track. Oh, I I absolutely agree. It 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 takes time for to find the right people where everybody's on the same page with the same understanding and musicians competent enough to know what the moment needs for the song. And luckily, um. Our our rhythm section, I mean, between Mike and Gary, um, it's so tasteful and it's so perfect on what the two of them do with with bass and drums in the rhythm section. It is, uh, y- you know, Mike Mike knows when to lay down the bass when it needs to be thick and heavy. Then he knows when to add embellishments to make make a, a maybe a more I don't want to say bland a more empty moment filled with something interesting. And yeah, the guys. And Gary, phenomenal drummer. Um, yeah, he's he's uh, definitely a, a, a rare breed to find someone who can do that, who has the skill and the inspiration enough to know when to go from the very heavy double bass, you know, fast pounding, and then and then lay back and just just hold down a nice backbeat or or some rhythmic interest. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I can't say enough about the musicians. I mean, that's what I've always said from the very beginning of my career. I'm not the best singer in the world. I am I am by far, you know, great, but I surround myself with great people and great musicians, and it just makes me sound so much better. So, yeah, I'm very proud of the guys I'm with. That's that's awesome. Paul, you know, uh, i got to be honest with you. There are very few people in, in at least uh, – in the in the metal scene that have this uh, wonderful skill uh, of of singing both clean and even the growls. I mean, uh, I there are examples. I mean, Devin Townsend, or let me say Michael Ackerfeld, and obviously you as well. Every time, I mean, every time I listen uh, to let's say you know the Novella Reservoir or even the track from uh, the Pale Horn Departure, it's always that sense of. Uh, that personal emotional touch in your vocals which somehow connects to a listener's heart it's just that the tone of your i don't, I don't know how to express it but it's that that goosebump moment where every time i listen to your softer side it just touches that uh, that that emotional side of me and when i listen to your growl it's that devil inside me that wakes up <laughs> i i appreciate that you know what i I, I can attribute that to a couple of things, really. Um, I've never looked at myself or thought of myself as a good singer. I've never taken vocal lessons. I've never properly learned how to sing. And I've been very, uh, you can tell just going through, I think, when you listen to our records from even the very first one until Hamardia, my confidence level has grown more and more and more. And I try new things and I add new things and I I take chances with my vocals. And because I never thought I was a very good singer, I did a lot of more basic things early on. And the person who's really helped me with this more than anybody is uh, Chris Wisco, our producer. He's been with us since the knowing he's worked with me. He is great with helping me work out the melodies and the harmonies and giving me ideas to try. So he's, he's helped me build my confidence and he has helped me get to a point where I'll try just about anything that he wants me to try because I know at the end of the day, he's not going to let something, I, I trust him enough where if I, if I do something and I'm like, yeah, Chris, I don't know, man, I, I I'm really uncomfortable with that. It doesn't feel right. If he tells me, Paul, trust me, it sounds amazing. I'm like, uh, uh okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I trust you. And he's normally right. And just then hearing the end result, it's, it's built my confidence over time where, yeah, now I'll try anything he says. And it's just, uh, it's become a lot more fun. I think it's why I do a lot more of the clean singing. Um, 
And the other thing we do in the studio is it's not always about capturing the greatest singing, you know, hitting the notes perfect and singing the perfect perform. It, it's about that emotional performance. We focus on catching just the right moment and, and then we'll work on, you know, it, it's that, it's that, like you said, you have to make that emotional connection first and foremost. Um, you know, some of my favorite vocalists in the world, like Jim Morrison, he was not the best singer in the world, but damn, he was a great front man and a great vocalist and he knew how to connect. And that's exactly the same kind of philosophy I've always had with it. Awesome, man. That's wonderful to hear. And also, the the length of the songs have always been um, fascinating to me that it's not just about you guys repeating the cycle for six minutes, but there's always that uh, that sort of uh, the ideas which which you guys bring in your compositions, which which kind of dab with the progressive songwriting, you know, the sort of uh, while you guys, you know, the, I kind of feel that the composition of flow seems to build more like a, a, a narrative of sorts that 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 reinforces itself uh, by you know the recurrence and the occasional injection of songwriting. I mean, you guys bring in some acoustic guitars in the middle, some clean tones in the middle, and the intros are always a slight bit of a build up and pretty much complement the, the underlying rhythms. Is that something which you guys focus on when you write the songs about how the uh, how this track has to flow? Uh, let, let me say, I'm, I'm talking about the structure of a song here because if it's a seven minute track, uh, some people feel that it's kind of getting more, uh, you know, repetitive. But in your case, it's that's that's completely different. Uh, there's a lot of thing that goes inside, which I've always been fascinated to ask you. How is it that you guys write seven minute song by not uh, repeating it all the while, but also make it, you know, more interesting, more uh, creative by adding these bits and pieces, like I said, which kind of makes it feel like there's a narration going on in the. I tell you exactly how and why that happens. Um, it comes from our influences when we sit down and write, and it it comes from what we grew up with and what has influenced us from the beginning. You know, we started this band in 1989. There were not a lot of metal bands that there are today where a lot of people will listen to our music and they'll say, oh, well, you clearly were influenced by this band and this band and and you must be influenced by this band and the answer is no not at all we were a band two albums in before we even heard of half of these bands you're mentioning it is we drew our influence from the same place that those bands drew their influence the only unfortunate thing is because of our geographical location they were noticed before we were by the masses so when it comes down to it um influences when we write our music uh from larry's side of things and from my side of things when i write vocals it comes from pink floyd it comes from it comes from the beatles it comes from uh for me the doors and peter gabriel and and larry's influenced by things like genesis and he's influenced by things like voivod and you know of course metallica back in the day things like that Vito, when he brings in music he is very much into things like uh dream theater and he's into bands like uh, this will destroy you and a lot of the post you know prog uh uh that instrumental uh prog not prog rock uh uh yeah, they, they have so many terms and genres for these bands these days i can't keep up with it but yeah he, he's into a lot of atmospheric kind of stuff so a lot of the influence we have does not come from metal bands at all. And I think Pink Floyd, more than any of them, Larry's heavily influenced. There's so much Pink Floyd in our music, and it's it, it's not necessarily stealing riffs. It's taking that idea of that arrangement and that atmosphere and creating that mood. And I think that is something that has gone in and, and why we remain you know, we're not a doom band. We've never considered ourselves a doom metal band or a death metal band. We have so much more to offer in the music from beginning to end. We just play a dark metal, and that's basically what we've always looked at. We're a dark metal band, and that's we just play a form of metal with emotional interludes, and it's just it's always depressing, and it's it's heavy in some way, heavy 
doesn't necessarily mean a loud, distorted guitar. Heavy can also mean very emotional and moody, and that's basically what we do. But yeah, it's it's um, when we write a seven minute song, it is always. I, and I don't say we sit down and say, okay, we need we need to write a song like Pink Floyd would have did. It, it, it's just so embedded in our DNA and so embedded in Larry's DNA that that's how our brains work at this point. That's how a song should be structured. That's how a great song should be structured. There are times where we've missed the mark, I feel. And exactly what you're saying, the song is too long. And when all is said and done, I can sit back and listen to it and say, we should have never repeated this entire thing again. We should have came up with something different. And that's the kind of stuff that makes us make a better album next time. That when you can sit down and critique your music and find your mistakes and say, okay, next time we won't do this again. We need to put more time into this and we need to do something different. We could have cut this down in half. And yeah, it, it's a lot of like, like sports teams. You go back to the tapes. You go back, you watch why you lost the fight, and you you train and fix that differently. Okay, I totally agree with that. Paul, thanks a lot, man, for, for spending some time. You know, always a great time having a chat with you. And um, if you had to sum up the, the sound of Hamartia in a sentence, what would you say? That's a good question. Um, wow. The sound of Hamartia in one sentence, I would say Hamartia is the very best of what November's Doom has done for the past 10 records. All in, yeah, that, that's it. 